Central Baptist Church. We are so glad that you could join us today online on this kind of a cold, yucky day. Um, so we're doing church online, but we hope that you are staying home and you're staying warm, you're staying safe, and you could just cuddle up and on the couch. Oh, what? Okay. Well, did it not look good? I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to fix it for church. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, we're going to have church and we're so excited. Uh, we're going to have a great time. We hope that you're cozy on the the, the chair. <laughs> Miles is being silly over here. Um, so maybe <laughs> your, <laughs> oh my goodness, maybe your uh, Sunday morning looks a little bit like this, a little distracted. Um, maybe you're uh, in the middle of playing with baby dolls. <laughs> maybe uh, you are about to play Knights of the Round Table while, while Clayton preaches. Um, regardless, um, we're going to have a great, a great Sunday morning. And if your house looks like this, if you are, uh, you got all the distractions around, um, that's life. That's what church is all about. That's doing life together. And I'm so glad that we get the chance to do that. So, um, Get your kids ready. If you're at home, that's fine. Um, uh, but but we're gonna have a great time. I hope you enjoy the service. 
and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Oh, no, no. <laughs>
of God's people said, amen, amen. You can be seated this morning. Amen. Hi, my name is Matt Flint. I serve here on the staff at Central Baptist Church. And this will be the normal time during the service when we'll be taking up the offering. And it's through the funds given by all of our members that we are able to fund the missions and ministries here at Central Baptist Church. If you'd like to be a participant in that way, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can just go to centralgives.com. You can pull up our app on the phone and give that way. Or you can just text it in and you can see this, uh, the number right there on the screen. We're excited about what we're going to be doing here. And even though we're not here in the church right now, uh, your funds will help us continue to do the missions and ministries here at Central Baptist Church where Jesus changes everything. Well, good morning, everybody. Man, I hope you all are having an awesome time at home and hope you got something to eat and something to drink because right in here, it smells like a bakery and I'm getting really hungry and I have all this food around me this morning because I, I realized and I found out that there is something that we do a ton every single year, 1800 times every single year we eat. If you think about that, in fact, the majority of us, we don't eat just three meals a day right now. Most Americans are eating five meals a day. And I found out how much we're actually eating in a, in a year. Here's some stats. The majority of us eat 630 pounds of dairy every single year, 185 pounds of meat, 197 pounds of wheat and grains, 85 pounds of oils and fats like, like butter, 273 pounds of fruit, and get this, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but they say 415 pounds of vegetables. Also, we consume 141 pounds of sweeteners, which includes 42 pounds of corn syrup, which is a lot of corn syrup. In total, it's just under a ton. Every single year, we eat about a ton of food. And see, we eat these things because we need them to fulfill what our body needs. We have some physical needs. But here's something that I've realized, and I hope you realize as well, that you are not just a physical being. You have a soul. In fact, the famous theologian, he was a Scottish man um, from about 150 years ago, his name's George MacDonald, he once said that you don't have a soul, you are a soul, and your soul has a body. And since we are souls, we have spiritual needs. And some of us realize that, that we have spiritual needs. And so we are in tune with that and we are feeding ourselves. But for a lot of us, we haven't figured that out. And so in essence, we are starving our souls. And so the question for us this morning is what can satisfy our souls? Or what do our souls actually need? You see, the basic need I believe for our souls is that we need to hear from the Lord. We need to understand that He is near us. We need to feel His presence and hear His voice. And that's where God's Word comes into to play this morning. And so here's what I want you to do. No matter what's going on, wherever you're at, go and find your copy of God's Word. Go and get your Bible. So maybe it's your phone, maybe it's your physical copy of the Bible, but it doesn't matter what I say right now, go, go and grab it. Um, I'm talking to my kids, literally, like my kids in the living room right now, go and grab your Bibles and then come and run back onto the couch because uh, you're going to need this while we go through today's message. You see, when Jesus was um, in Matthew chapter 4, He was... He was uh, in the wilderness, he was 40 days fasting and praying. And, and, then, and then Satan shows up in the picture. And if you can imagine being in, the, in that kind of situation for 40 days and, and not eating for that, that long of, of a period, um, you can imagine what was going on in Jesus' physical body. I've fasted before, not for any, any length of time anywhere near that. But I can tell you what, every single piece of food that I that mind thought about or I saw, Man, it was like gold to me. And so Satan shows up and he tells Jesus and says, if you really are the son of God, look at all these rocks around you. Why don't you take those and turn them into these loaves of bread? Why don't you turn them into bread? And Jesus says something I think it's really important for us in verse four. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter four, verse four. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so I think we need to come to a point where we see God's word, not as a set of rules for us to follow, but actually for as nourishment for our bodies. And so this morning, I just wanted to spend a few minutes showing you some, some secrets to filling 
your souls with the food that you need. And so here's some, here's secret number one for feeding our souls. It's this, you have to eat the right food. You gotta eat the right food. Remember I talked about how we consume about 415 pounds of vegetables um, every year. That's, that's almost three times the amount of meat in, in pounds per year. And I'm thinking that is not accurate at all. But I realized we're not talking about like healthy vegetables. We're talking about things like corn and potatoes. Corn and potatoes. I mean, that is it. You're talking about French fries and potato chips. I mean, that's, and, or, or chips, like corn chips. Man, we eat these a ton. I mean, that's like my diet right there is, are those two things. And so when it really comes to us eating, we have to eat the right things. If we want our bodies to be properly nourished, we need to eat the right things. And spiritually, when we think about our souls, if we want our souls to be nourished, we have to eat the right things. We have to consume the right things. Here's what God's Word says about itself. Psalm, Psalm 119, 105 says that your Word, God's Word, is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. 2 Timothy 3.16 that says that all Scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. Hebrews 4.12 says that, that the Word of God is alive and active, and then describes it in a really cool way, like, like a sword. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing our soul and spirit, our joints and marrow. And here's what it does. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We need God's Word. We need it to fulfill us. If we're going to eat the right things spiritually, we need it to be consuming God's Word. And the problem is a lot of us are just starving ourselves. And so that's the first secret to feeding our, soul, so our souls. The second secret to feeding our souls is that you have to know how to slice it. I want you to imagine if you came into your, your, your kitchen and on your kitchen counter is this loaf of bread, but you've never seen bread before. You've never consumed it. You've never eaten it before. And you're, figure, you're trying to think, how in the world am I supposed to, to eat this? And so you might think, well, maybe I, you just like just tear it apart and you just, you just eat it and just cram it down that way. Or maybe you feel like, you know, I, I, should, I should take it and, and like, you know, peel it like an orange and I'm just going to, I'm just going to take the, the middle out. And I'm just going to eat the middle that way and create like this, this bowl to put stuff in. Or maybe you're like, you're just grabbing, you know, like the mashers right here and you just start mashing it like this and you try to flatten it so you can eat it. Or maybe you grab a spoon and you feel like you got to, you got to take a spoon out and you start, you start trying to spoon the bread into your mouth. You don't know how in the world you're going to eat it. Well, I think that's sometimes how we are with God's Word. We look at it and we're like, I, I don't know even how to consume it. I realize that I need it for my spiritual well-being and, and for nourishment, but I don't know how to consume it. And so there is a right way to consume God's Word. There's a right way to slice it. So like bread, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take it and you take a knife and you slice it real nice and gently like this, right? And not, not cut your finger or anything like that. You take, you take the knife and you slice it. We need to understand how we're supposed to slice God's Word. And the, the theolo theological way of explaining that or saying that is to have a proper hermeneutics of the Bible. Hermeneutics is just the way that we interpret Scripture, the way we look at Scripture. We need to have, a, have proper principles and methods. So let me give you just like a, a couple of hints, a couple of ways that you can properly slice God's Word. Number one, the Bible should be interpreted or sliced literally. So the question you got to ask is, when you're reading the Bible, is what is the plain meaning? What is the plain meaning of the text? Or remember this, this phrase, that the Bible says what it means and means what it says. For example, if you go to the Gospels and you read about Jesus feeding the 5,000, you know, you can look at that and think of it, think of it allegorically, or, or it's a, maybe it's a metaphor. What does 5,000 really mean? Or what does the, the bread and the, the fish really mean? Well, simply put, for the vast majority of the Bible, it just means what it says. Like Jesus literally fed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. That's what he did. We need to look at God's word literally. Number two is we should, we should interpret or slice God's word historically, grammatically, and contextually. Let me, let me explain that. So historically, you got to look at the cultural background. What was going on when it was actually written? For example, when, when Jesus, he goes to his first disciples and he, he says, drop your nets and come follow me. You know, for us, we say, oh man, that's just, oh, that sounds so good. But you got to look at it historically, culturally, what was actually going on? And what did that mean for a first century Jewish man? Man, when we, when we look at that, 
we look from their eyes and their perspective, it can change the whole meaning of the text. Second, grammatically. You gotta look at this, look at the text grammatically. And what I mean by that is the original language. The majority of the Bible is written in Hebrew, the Old Testament, and the majority of the New Testament was written in Greek. So we gotta look at and, and figure out, and there's all sorts of ways you can go online and study and find um, what the original text meant. Um, look at commentaries and that sort of thing. For example, like in Titus chapter two, uh, Paul, he's describing Jesus, and he, he says this. He writes of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, our great God, that's what, it, that's what it says. And if you look at that w without understanding what's actually going on in the language, you might say that he's talking about two separate people. Our great God that's on one plate and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so you could look at that and say, well, he's saying that that Jesus is over here and God is over here. But if you look at the, in the Greek, what it's actually saying is that this, this phrase, our great God and our Savior, those are on parallel terms and they are describing Jesus. And so in the original language, uh, grammatically, he's saying that Jesus is both God and Savior combined. And so it kind of changes how we see scripture. And, and finally, we got to look at it contextually. And what contextually means is the environment that the, that the verse is in. So if you're reading a passage or verse of scripture, you got to look at what's going on before this, that verse. You got to look at what's going on after that verse. And in fact, you need to kind of look at what is the whole book. If you're reading, I'm, I got my Bible turned to Jonah right now. So I read through Jonah. What, what is Jonah actually saying throughout the entire book? And, and you also have to look at that single verse that you're looking at in the whole context of God's word. Um, as as a single entity. So what happens is if you don't do this, sometimes you'll take the verse out of context. And here's a, here's a good example. So in Matthew chapter five, verse 38, Jesus teaching and he says this, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now if that's all you read, most of you guys know what, what comes after that, but if that's all you read, here's what happens. You look at the words of Jesus and you say, you know what, Jesus is telling me an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, that's the law, that's the rule. So I need to go get some tats. I need to get eye for an eye over here, tooth for tooth over here. So if someone messes with me, I'm gonna punch them back, right? If someone uh, messes with my family, I'm gonna mess with their family. Um, if someone uh, does something wrong or talks behind my back, I'm gonna go and talk behind their back. If someone hurts me, I'm gonna hurt them. We see that and they say, that's what Jesus has to say. But that's not contextually accurate because the very next verse, here's what Jesus says. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Be different. If an, anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. A lot of people say this, that context is king. And it really is, because context drives the way that we read God's word. It is the proper way that we slice God's word. So that is the, the, second, the second secret. So let me back up. First secret, we need to eat the right food. Second secret, we need to know how to slice it. And here's the third secret to, to feeding our souls. You have to put the baby bottle down and pick up a knife and a fork. So a knife and a fork. Eventually, this is what has to, has to, you have to look like as a spiritually mature person. You see, little babies, they don't eat bread, do they? No, little babies don't eat bread, they eat milk. And for brand new believers, there is a spiritual milk for you. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 2 and 3, Peter describes it and he says this to brand new believers. He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up into your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He's saying, hey, brand new Christians, this is what you're supposed to be, supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be consuming spiritual milk like newborn babies. But if you want to grow, if you want to grow in your relationship with God, if you want to grow spiritually and in, into spiritual maturity, eventually you got to get to a point where you begin to crave spiritually solid food. So let me, me kind of describe that here. Hebrews chapter five, the author of Hebrews, he's teaching on how Jesus is the great high, high priest. And honestly, that's, that's pretty deep spiritually, maybe something we don't always understand. But then he says this in verse 11 of Hebrews five, he says, we have much to say about this, but you know what? It's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. And anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. He says this, but solid food is for the mature, 
who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You see, I think the best way for us to, to determine our spiritual age is not necessarily to look at how, how long we've been a Christian. You know, I'm, I was uh, saved on Cinco de Mayo, and, and so I know that my, my spiritual birthday is then, I can calculate how many years I've been, been a Christian. But the reality is, you know, I really have not been a Christian for, for 27 years. I'm not a 27-year-old Christian. I may be a 12-year-old Christian or an eight or a six-year-old Christian. You see, I don't think the best way for us to determine how, how long we've, our spiritual age or, or, of our Christianity or our faith is not by how long we've been a Christian, but by what kind of food we're ingesting. And the reality is a lot of us, maybe it say, we say that we were saved a long time ago, but we're taking it, still taking in spiritual milk. And there comes a point where we have to, to put the, the baby bottle down right? We got to put it aside. We got to pick up our knife and our fork and begin to really dive into God's word. So let me, let me finish with this. You may ask, what is spiritual food? What is a spiritually solid food? You see, babies, they, they drink milk because it's easy to digest, right? It's easy to swallow. And a simple way to, to understand what spiritually solid food is, is that it's things in God's word that are hard to swallow. Think about that. You know, it's, it's really easy. A spiritually baby, spiritual baby food would be things like, God loves me. And that is easy to digest, isn't it? It's easy to swallow. God loves me. But when Jesus says to take up your cross and follow me, man, that is deep. That's stuff that you have to wrestle with. And so when you begin to take in spiritually solid food, what happens is you take your knife and you take uh, your knife and your fork and you begin to cut it. You begin to cut that spiritual food. You begin to kind of dice it and think about it and, and wrestle with it and dig deep into God's word. And here's what happens. It begins to change you. It changes your heart. It begins to change your attitudes. And finally, it begins to change your actions. You know that you're taking in spiritually solid food when God's word is actually affecting your life. And so here's what you need to do, church. Let's feast, right? As a church, let's feast on God's Word. Let's begin to do that. Let's devour God's Word every single day. In your personal life, you need to be in God's Word, devouring it. Every single week with your family, you need to sit down and, and jump into Scripture together. And every time you, you get together with your friends in your small groups, man, you need to get together and begin to, to study and to, to think deeply and to grab your knife and your fork and to study God's Word, to put the baby bottle down and begin to actually take in, take in spiritually solid food. Man, I love you guys. I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning. And I, I want you to know that I'm praying for you this week that God would reveal to you um, what kind of food you're taking in. And let's begin to, to eat the spiritually solid food that God has for us as we grow into maturity. In fact, let me pray for you right now. God, thank you so much for our church. Thank you for everyone that is listening this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take a step back and, and evaluate our own lives. Are we taking in spiritually solid food? Are we growing into maturity? Because God, our souls need your word. For some of us, we're not even drinking even the milk. We are, we are starving ourselves. God, help us to see that we are souls that need spiritual food. And we thank you that your word is what we need. It's what we crave. Our souls crave hearing from you and knowing you. So God, help us this week to find a love for your word and to study it, to wrestle with it. And God, I pray that it would change our lives. We pray this in the great name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Central Baptist family and friends. Thank you for joining us on Streamland. As you could see, we could not meet today because of this wonderful winter wonderland. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to join us next week as Pastor Clayton continues the series on money. I know you can't wait for that it's an exciting time to talk about giving as unto the Lord. By the way, I sure enjoyed this sermon today, but you know, daily bread, is there a gluten-free version? Because you know, I, I, I got the celiac. God bless you, I love you.